Okay, so uh, we're group six, and uh, this is our project on wireless power transfer for uh, implantable medical devices. Uh, I'm Adam, this is Graham. So, first we'll talk about a little bit of the motivation for this project. So, implantable medical devices have been revolutionizing the field of personalized medicine, and uh, devices are generally things like pacemakers and defibrillators, spinal cord stimulator, uh, stimulators, they're things that are implanted directly into the body. And these generally require some power to run. So generally they use batteries. And batteries have a lot of problems. They're uh, bulky, they have finite lifetime, and when you need to replace them, you need to do an invasive surgery. So we looked into alternate designs to power these devices. So what we thought about was uh, mostly low intensity microwaves because they carry sufficient power to power these devices and they're also capable of uh, penetrating the skin. So our project was to design a wireless power transfer system with the goal of eliminating or reducing the battery size for these devices. So we developed some customer requirements and we decided to focus on the end user of the device. So for that, the obvious things are safety and regulatory compliance are very important. So we don't want to be like cooking the person when we're, when we're trying to power them, cooking them with microwaves. Uh, we want it to be undetectable to the patient, easy implantation, uh, long lifetime and low cost. So we decided to focus on, we thought about what are, wh how is wireless, uh, a wireless signal usually transmitted? And the first thing that comes to mind is an antenna. So an antenna is simply a transducer which takes electromagnetic waves as input and outputs an AC signal. So you can see a really good schematic of it right here. You have your alternating electric field from the electromagnetic wave and it sweeps electrons back and forth in the metal which is essentially alternating current. So you have alternating current but the problem is you need DC current, direct current to power your actual device. So uh, for that, we need a rectenna. And this is basically, the antenna is the AC source for the rest of the device, which, which per, its purpose is to turn that into direct current for the powering of the device. So we have a low pass filter, which uh, filters out higher order harmonics of the antenna. We have a diode, which rectifies the signal into pulses. And then we have a, a DC bypass filter, which just lets the DC signal through to the load resistor at the end, which would be the device. So for our functional specs, given this rectenna design, we wanted low power. We got the 0.8 watt at least, or, or sorry, less than 0.8 watts of incident radiation from the uh, Consumer and Clinical Radiation Protection Bureau. Um, we want it to be small and lightweight. Ideally, we thought a 25% reduction in powering unit volume would be a really good goal to achieve. And we wanted low directionality. So by that, we mean multi multiple polarizations, so you're not, and, and also like a large angle of absorption. We chose 60 degrees from the normal because we want it to be powered from any point in a room, let's say, and we don't want that to depend on your orientation to the source. We uh, ideally want a large powering distance and a long lifetime. So uh, the key design specification that's really important is impedance matching between the antenna and the diode. That's the number one thing because that determines your rectification efficiency and the overall efficiency of power transfer. Um, we also d decided to go for a 12 gigahertz uh, target operation for the frequency because we found from the literature that this penetrated the skin and tissue pretty well and it was also allowed, it's also a higher frequency than is generally used but that allows us to get a little smaller with the device because generally the device depends on the wavelength which would be smaller in this case. Um, and we want it, as I said before, to handle both polarizations if possible. Okay. So I'm going to talk a little bit about our system of choice. So we performed a literature search um, to try and find antenna designs or rectenna designs that would meet our functional specifications. And we came across this design that we think fits our purposes quite well. So this is a stepped impedance dipole antenna. Uh, and by stepped impedance, it's just because there's um, two different widths of the, of the antenna uh, in, the, in various portions of the antenna. And that allows us to reduce the footprint of the device by about 28% relative to a standard dipole antenna, which Adam introduced earlier. And I'm gonna go through step by step uh, the various parts of this, this whole schematic so that it's clear. Um, so the purpose of uh, the antenna is of course to receive the microwave radiation, convert it into AC power, and channel it to our various rectification circuit elements, um, which are connected through this coplanar strip line device. Um, and the gap size between the two arms of the antenna is chosen so that our diode, which is quite small, will be able to fit across them. Um, the diode itself was selected to, based on the impedance of it. So in order to have maximum power transfer, it's important that all of the, so the various elements 
uh, of the schematic are impedance matched so that there's maximum power transfer between them. Um, this uh, little finger design here is an interdigital capacitor which acts as a low pass filter. So any high, high frequency harmonics which tend to be generated by the diode um, are not, do not get to the antenna to be re-radiated which would cause a loss of efficiency for us. And uh, this other chip capacitor over here actually takes the, the pulsed uh, signal that comes from the diode and converts it straight into a DC current which can be dissipated across our load uh, and turned into useful power. Um, so these papers presented various results to us and we thought that it would be a really good idea to uh, perform simulations on them to verify their results and confirm that it's actually what they claim what it is. Uh, our solution, our, our software of choice was ComSol Multiphysics. We're relatively familiar with it and we were, we were able to reproduce the, the results uh, very well. ComSol itself is not too well set up to do, perform circuit element simulations. Um, so we performed those in uh, a software suite called Advanced Air ADS, uh, Advanced Design System. So uh, the general schematic for these simulations is we would sim like generate the antenna geometry in ComSol, um, extract the antenna parameters from it, and then put those into ADS in order to simulate the circuit elements of it. Um, so I'm going to go into a little more detail on how we, how we set up our ComSol simulations and our ADS simulations. So uh, you can see our, our structure on the two images on the right. Um, the, the, rect the rectangular box that you see is our substrate, and on top of that is our antenna. The antenna is modeled by a perfect electric conductor boundary condition, which essentially models a material with zero resistance or perfect conductivity, which for our purposes models uh, metal quite well. Um, the antenna is fed with a lumped port boundary condition, which is essentially just an AC source with um, an input impedance that we can control. And surrounding the entire simulation are perfectly matched layers, which is essentially just a condition that absorbs any uh, incident radiation and allows us to um, accurately extract the antenna's parameters. So for the results of that simulation, uh, we extract the impedance of the actual antenna. So the ComSol simulation is just of the antenna. We then take that, that's the, the impedance values is what we take and we plug into ADS. On the right, that, that's the plot on the left. On the top right, you can see the uh, S11 versus frequency. So S11 for antennas is basically a measure of reflectance. So if you have low reflectance, your antenna is absorbing. And we get really good absorption at five gigahertz, which is around what we were expecting. And we, uh, on the bottom right there, you can see a plot of the electric field norm at that frequency, and we have pretty high field in the device, as you'd expect. Oh, and I'll just quickly outline the ADS simulation again. So, um, or not again, sorry, just outline the ADS simulation. Uh, so the antenna is modeled as, in this case, a AC source, because that is essentially what it is, uh, with a frequency-dependent input impedance, which is imported from ComSol. So that is how we import the, how we connect the two simulations. And then again are all of the circuit components which I've introduced previously. I'll go over them quickly again. The interdigital capacitor connected by a coke planar strip line to the rest of the elements, which include a diode, a capacitor, and ultimately the load resistance. Um, what we're interested in is the rectification efficiency, so the power dissipated across the load over the input power. And that's essentially how we generate um, our efficiency uh, plots and rectification efficiency. So for the, actually, for the actual efficiency of the rectification, we have another S11 versus frequency plot, and this is reflectance off of the circuit. So again, you want the circuit to absorb your, or your energy from the antenna. So that's what you see there at exactly 5.8 gigahertz, which is where we'd expect it from the literature. Um, our power efficiency versus frequency is on the right, and you see we get around 30% efficiency, which met our requirements, but could be improved with better impedance matching, but that's for future steps. So now I'm just going to go a little bit into our fabrication process about how we make the device. It's really straightforward. It's just you, one layer. It's planar. So you just deposit the aluminum. You deposit resist, pattern the resist, pattern, uh, etch the aluminum, and then you're, you end up with your shape of your device. It's pretty simple. It's straightforward. So this is what the final device looks like. We have the antenna there, uh, the interdigital capacitor right there, uh, the diode in the middle, and the capacitor at the bottom. That's what it looks like. Um, the diode and capacitor were really small, so to attach those, instead of using 
conventional soldering techniques, we just used a conductive epoxy, but we were able to get good connection, and we tested all the connection, and the devices were on there and not damaged. So now I'm gonna go a bit into our validation plan about how we tested it, but, but I'll show you our testing setup because it makes this schematic make a little more sense. Pretty much this is what it looks like. On the right, we have our horn antenna, which we got from the lab, and that's hooked up to a signal generator outside of this room. This room itself is an anechoic chamber. You can see the, the, uh, the cones on the walls, those absorb all the ambient radiation. On the left there, we have the antenna hooked up, and we have the probes there to measure any, um, you know, the voltage across the, you know, the rectified voltage. So uh, here's what the validation plan looks like. Um, on the left there, that's our, um, our signal generator hooked up to our horn antenna. And step one was to just test the antenna itself and to measure the S11 parameter using a vector network analyzer. Um, step two and three and four are all measuring the actual rectification. So step two, we vary the power of the input signal and we, uh, we try to find a power that gets us a good enough efficiency for rectification. Step three, we fix the power and we change the frequency to make sure that we get a good rectification at the frequency we'd expect. And finally, step four, we fix both of those and we change the load impedance to see where we get a good impedance match. The highest efficiency would be at a certain impedance. So when we actually tested it, um, the problem was is we didn't end up getting a signal across the device. And unfortunately, due to time and uh, time constraints and the um, equipment we had, we weren't able to do step, uh, step, we were only able to do step two and three. Now, we didn't get a result, but we think the reason why for that is, uh, the reason why that happened is it was difficult to measure how much of the antenna's radiation was actually reaching our antenna. So all of our simulations were based on input antenna, input energy directly to our antenna. We think if that got spread out a little bit, we wouldn't have enough um, actual radiation hitting our antenna, which is why we wouldn't get results. So yeah, anyways, uh, yeah, so now we're, this is our second design. Okay, so this is something else we've been considering. I'm gonna go through it relatively quickly in the interest of time, um, but we, uh, this design has a number of benefits to it. Uh, for one, it's an antenna array, so it's more densely packed and would be able to harvest um, electromagnetic energy much more densely and get much more of it. So antenna arrays have a lot of benefits for our purposes. Um, the problem with it is that they're really dense and very difficult to feed and attach to the various circuit elements. This design is interesting in that um, the circuit elements are actually on the backside of the design. So uh, they connect the antenna to the circuit elements through through-hole vias through the entire structure. Um, and there is also a conducting ground plane in the middle, which is a bit of a detail that I'm, I'll sort of skim over. Um, but this design is capable of harvesting both polarizations because there's essentially two di different dipole antennas in the two different directions. Um, and we actually, they actually select which, um, which polarization is rectified based on just where they place the via in the structure, which is interesting. Um, we've performed a few simulations on it, so also in COMSOL, uh, send in a plane wave with a, with a given polarization. Uh, you can see the electric field plots on the right and the efficiency with which the antenna actually absorbs the radiation on the left for the various polarizations as well as the sum of the two polarizations. And very quickly again, we performed uh, ADS simulations with the circuit elements uh, in, in the simulation with the same procedure that we outlined before and we obtained an 80% uh, efficiency, 80% uh, efficiency at the design frequency, which matches, exa matches very well with what was presented in the literature by Almanif et al. Um, and for our purposes, we're, we're interested in scaling things down, making things operate at a higher frequency. Um, and so we tried that out and the efficiency was not affected very much so that we think that's promising for what we're hoping to do with this. Um, and I've already discussed some of the limitations of it. It's very difficult to fabricate for us, but it would be an interesting thing to try out. Okay, and now let me conclude. So design, design one uh, was successfully fabricated and simulated. Uh, testing was incomplete, um, but we think if we played around with things a little bit, we might be able to get some interesting results. Um, simulation results of design two are promising and would uh, meet most of our design requirements and functional specifications. Um, and the simulations of both are promising for size reduction and what we're trying to do with this project. And I'll finally conclude with some future steps that we could take on this project. So essentially we would like to play around with some of the circuit elements and aspects of the design to try and get things working. 
uh, incorporate a diode with a lower turn on voltage, maybe that would help uh, investigate different dielectric layers, play around with the coplanar strip line's length in an attempt to better impedance match the structure. And uh, in, the, in the future, we would like to investigate, reinvestigate um, antenna arrays uh, because of the density and ability to collect greater power and power the future of biomedical implants. So thank you. That is all. <laughs>